Hello. So, I'm going to talk about the new OpenRISC CPU core that I've been working on and Stefan's been working on. Um, so, the MOR1KX is from the ground up re implementation of an OpenRISC 1000 compliant CPU core. Um, <clears throat> so, I'll talk about I don't know, the, the next slide is probably completely useless to this audience. I wasn't sure who was going to come. Uh, I'll talk about why we did it, and then what we wanted to do, and what we've done. And I don't really have much of a fancy demo, I'm afraid. I can run some simulations and things, but... Uh, <sighs> so, talking about microprocessors, obviously. So, um, yeah, that's just some basics. It's a thing which does calculations, basically. Uh, and again, another slide for the uninitiated. But everyone's initiated, so. <laughs> okay. So everyone's familiar with the OR1200, which is the CPU that's been around for over 10 years now, and that has been the sort of main synthesizable open risk processor implementation. So I worked with it for a few years, and you know you quickly come across its shortcomings, mainly in terms of its you know when you're working with it, it is a bit of a mess code-wise. Um, yeah, I mean it works right. <laughs> That's the main thing. <laughs> so you live with it. But if you want to do anything to it, like modify, add another register stage, find out what on earth those critical paths actually mean <laughs> when you read them in a synthesis report. It's just not easy. Um, so yeah, it's a monolithic pipeline implementation. It's just stuff running everywhere, from stage to stage. Uh, one of the big things, is, as Sven said, it's like really good to be able to just email a guy and you know get an answer within you know an hour or at least a week, right, to a problem you're having. Uh, the guy, like whoever wrote the core initially, Damian or whatever, he just I don't know, he's not around anymore. And you know, people like myself who still hack on it and, and work with it. I mean, I'm not familiar with everything, so I'll get questions. You know, like, like the cache bug that you posted about. Sure, I kind of know what's going on, but I can't go in and uh, tell you off the top of my head. You know, like I could with an implementation that I'd actually written. So, yeah, for that reason, the MR1KX sort of started as an idea. It was worth noting it went in 10 years before we discovered that 13 instructions had not actually been implemented. <laughs> yeah, mainly because GCC didn't admit them. So Yeah, exactly. And it was only when Wackers Ahmed did his um, UVM Masters, yeah. uh, you know, we were expected about a few changes. He found that the whole instructions were missing. That goes to the, that goes to the lack of like, a real verification suite for a lot of this stuff, which is uh, a whole other discussion topic which would be very interesting to have I think it's something that we need to address with this project but we'll talk about that later so anyway I wanted something that was actually good so I mean I'm not talking about cutting corners here just to make the code pretty I want the thing to be good and fast right um, but actually nice and easy to work with uses good code practices um, and is maintained you know. yeah, also mean tested or well tested verified Ah, oh, yeah. Um, Easy to verify. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like no one's done. Done. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to do. Just, it's easy. I'm going to do it. <laughs> Almost <laughs> too easy. Sorry? Sorry? Left for the implementation. Yes, that's right. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, mainly I wanted to rewrite it from the ground up. Because I like the idea of the Neos, right? Hey, you just flick a switch and you get something. You're sort of optimizing area for you know, the sake of performance, or the other way around, right? Uh, I like that idea, because on an FPGA implementation, if you're really struggling for space, you want to just be able to go, all right, I don't care how fast it's going to run, just fit it in the FPGA. Or, you know, conversely, you've got a lot of area, but you're struggling for performance, so use up a bit more area. I mean, you can sort of get the tools to do that, but what they're capable of is, is limited, I think. So having different RTL implementations, which actually will, you know, use more registers and sure you get a longer pipeline, but you can clock it faster. And that'd be cool. So I thought we would do that. Uh, 
also understand what's going on. The code's pretty well documented. I mean, it's not great, but the variable names actually mean something. And uh, it's not coded badly, I think. It's, it's pretty good. So, oh yeah, code it easy, quickly and easily. What I meant there was I use a lot of the Verilog mode automatics for hooking things up. So say you want to run like a, a, a signal from one pipeline stage to the other, you just declare it in one line as an output from one thing and an input to the other thing. And then all you've got to do is control A in three files and it will have hooked it up. That's not entirely true. You then have to go into the, the place where both those modules are instantiated and in the instantiation template put that line in. But anyway. That makes things easier, right? Instead of like manually coding every single bloody thing. Uh, Verilog's a bit annoying in that regard, I think. Uh, so when actually using it, I wanted to have like a test bench where I would press a button and then just the Verilog would give me a disassembly trace. So there's many ways of doing that. And I think Olaf has been trying to get a VPI interface into the test bench, which then called the same disassembly function as, say, OR1K sim or the, the assembler, right? Uh, we need to actually fix that. That would be really good to have. Have like a unified disassembler between OR1K sim, the Verilog models, the Cycle Accurate models. That would be really and good. And the pre disassembler. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I assume that's built in there. That's already done that bit. <laughs> so, uh, and then I want to use a Verilator a lot because Verilator I think is highly underrated. It's good because I don't know, it gives you a fast model, but it's a strict linter, and um, you can do all sorts of stuff with the Verilated model. I think it's a very good thing. Um, so, after, I don't know, maybe like a year or so of like sort of stuffing around, I have, well, with the help of Stefan, um, it's about 9,000 lines of Verilog, and we have three pipelines implemented mostly tested and working as far as we can see. So there's the cappuccino espresso and something I got put together in the last couple of weeks was the pronto espresso which is, you'll see, it's sort of a modified version of the espresso. Um, so the idea is that we have like the, the top level of the CPU and then caches and bus interfaces but then at the actual CPU level it's then modular and you can flick a Verilog parameter and select which pipeline implementation you want. Just like I imagine the NEOS HDL would look if they didn't obfuscate the netlist or wankers. <laughs> um, anyway, first one, cappuccino. It's a five stage pipeline. Very much like the R1200. So I started off doing that because, I don't know, <laughs> the R1200 was the first one we had and I thought, oh, all single issue, you know, risk pipelines should be five stage because a lot of them are like that. Um, so, started off got it working. I took it to a stage and then wanted to focus on the smaller pipeline implementations. So uh, Chris, no, oh, Stefan took over and uh, implemented caches, uh, solved a few problems. So that was, that was pretty cool. So that allowed me to go on and work on the espresso pipeline. So the espresso pipeline is uh, shorter. It's basically two stages, like a fetch and then single cycle. Uh, everything else. <coughs> so that's actually a lot easier to design and build <laughs> that sort of pipeline. It's good. Uh, but I did make sure that you can still get single cycle execution and uh, the, there's no cache on it but you can burst straight in from the bus so it will sustain burst accesses and continue like single cycle execution. That's as, very good. As instructions come out of the bus. Yes, I know because you don't need a cache then. No, that's right. That's, that's pretty good. good. But, I don't know, it's, it turns out... you're executing from internal memory. Yes, exactly, because then you're not churning up two loads of memory in a cache implementation than, than an internal memory. You it from M0, then. Maybe, yes. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and this is even better. The Pronto Espresso is something that doesn't have the delay slot. <laughs> Very important, I think. Can that be a ristretto or something? Sorry? Can that be a ristretto? Well, I was thinking calling it Ristretto, but that, I think that will be a single oh, stage. Okay. I'm saving that name for a single stage execution, <laughs> like everything at one stage. So, 
doesn't have a delay stop, but does it have a documentation? Uh, a what? <laughs> documentation? No. Come <laughs> 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 uh, So yeah, that, that's what we have. We have three pipelines, and really only two pipelines. Um, a long one and a short one. So yeah, the idea is that it's very modular. Inside, not only at the pipeline level, but inside the pipeline as well. So we've only got one decode module, and that's reused um, between the, in, that's reused in every pipeline in implementation. The same with the execute stage. Uh, the register file is slightly different between the pipeline stages because there's slightly different conditions controlling the the write enable. But you could refactor that and use the same register file module. Uh, same with the LSU, I think. The load store unit thing, which does the data bus accesses, you could probably refactor that and make that generic between them. So the idea is that you just end up with a few files which just have different control logic in them, and then you get the benefit of like multiple pipeline implementations. So one of the things I did was remove the reliance upon tick defines in Verilog for configuring the thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, for instance, in the IO1200, to enable the multiplayer, you had to go in and like uncomment this line in a file, in like a header file, and then you know you had to make sure you did that in every single place or every single implementation you want to change that in, instead of just doing this. So, uh, in the MIO1KX instantiation, you have a parameter that you pass in, saying like, I want a three-stage uh, full multiplier implementation. So that's what that is doing. And every single architectural and implementation option is specified this way. There are no tick defines um, which control any of the implementation stuff. So that's kind of handy. But it's not that great a thing. You could do that for the OI1200. OK, so you write a CPU, but you've got to test it, right? <laughs> so I basically forked OrbSock 2. <laughs> because there wasn't enough forking of stuff around the place. <laughs> and it's mainly so I could just be pragmatic with the testing, and just not care if you know something was MLR1KX specific. I didn't know what you could do. What could I do? Not so free. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I probably will, actually. So I also developed as a, um, like a monitor, a good monitor, because I found out when I was developing the OI1200, it was annoying every time I made a change, um, because you had to go and like modify the monitor. And I knew if I was doing multiple pipelines, I didn't want to have to maintain a bloody monitor along with the pipelines. So I made sure that I like exposed just a few signals at the top level of the pipeline or the CPU implementation level, which were sort of like standard. So I made sure there was a signal that went high for every time like the CPU or the pipeline finished executing a, an instruction. Uh, and I made sure that the PC was you know, also s synchronous with that edge that went high. So you don't have to you know, go and modify the stuff in the test bench for every update you do to the pipeline. That's quite handy. Uh, I also wrote an open risk disassembly in functions in Yeah. <laughs> That uh, wasn't fun. <laughs> so I tried to make it look exactly like the OR1K sim disassembly stuff. And uh, yeah, there's no string formatting functions in Verilog. <laughs> so I had to get, I had to count all the spaces for everything. <laughs> then I had to write functions which counted the spaces. I was like, oh. uh, and then some basic checker functionality. That's kind of important. So that's kind of nice, which, you know, make sure that the fetch stage didn't screw up and give you an instruction that's like the next one, or, you know, doesn't. The executing PC doesn't get out of step with the actual instruction that's reading it. Stuff like that. Uh, also, I made sure that the cycle accurate Verilator models worked. Uh, yeah, it also runs on a couple of boards. I think Stefan's going to well, you know, demonstrate that in a bit. So the question is is it any good though? <laughs> uh, it's better to work with, uh, but is it faster? How does it perform? What are its implementation <coughs> characteristics like? Well, in the little, in the few synthesis runs I ran just yesterday, it looks worse <laughs> in every respect. 
but uh, it's very hard to compare, right, exactly uh, OR1200 for MR1KX. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the OR1200 that is not optional that is in the MR1KX in the various pipeline implementations. And I haven't gone through and checked that it is like apples for apples comparison. But roughly, but anyway, you can still see. So here we have uh, FPGA implementation sizes. So the less is no hardware divide and multiply, no rotate instructions, basically just op like turning off a lot of the optional stuff in ALU and the caches. So the, uh, I mean, they're, they're roughly the same, right? Roughly well, the same. Well, on the Spartan 6, they're all better, aren't they? Oh, I guess so. If you yeah, look at registers. I don't know why the OI-1200, I, I was a bit worried that was an error. Did you check the block RAM usage? Oh, no. Could be a... Would be that. Mm. Sorry, I'm mainly comparing. Okay, so on the Spartan 6, it's better. But uh, I'm mainly comparing the OI1200 and the Cappuccino because they're the more, that's the more apples for apples. Perhaps. So in that regard, the OI1200 is a little bit better, but you know, that's life. I may have synthesized it for TSMC 40 nanometer <laughs> and found out uh, it was 23k gates. So that's pretty good, actually for a little processor. Um, of course, then you have the problem that the code density is quite bad, so no one's actually going to implement ROM space to run code on an ASIC for that sort of thing. Um, why, why is the code space bad? Just because it, it is? Bad. Well, it's expensive, you know, silicon area for, for your ROM. You know? Oh, yeah. So, you know, if you have bad <coughs> code density. You could probably compress the OR1K binary output a fair bit. But that's why we need our 2 k so stick around. Come tomorrow and we'll discuss more of that. Um, and what's the impact on, on, on clock speed? Uh -huh, I'm glad you asked. Oh, right. So, the R1200 is still faster. Uh, do, you have a, do you have an understanding why that is? Because I thought you, you always used to tell me that the R1200 ran like a dog because of the way the cache went all over the place. Yeah, I mean, the critical path. Well, I don't know, this is, uh, this is synthesizing this thing standalone, right? Yeah. So when you actually put it in, in a design and then you have signals coming into the fetch stage and into the cache. Although they're never really the critical path, are they? The critical path is some sort of exception. The critical path is from the exception number through the instruction pointer generator. Yeah, and then into the cache, right? Yeah. Or, and if you've got an MMU enable, it goes through that as well. Yeah. Yeah, so good luck sorting that out. <laughs> <laughs> Not really going to try the, it actually, unless I get paid. I think <laughs> the critical path in these designs, though, in the MLR1KX, is usually out of the register file and through the ALU, which is where you'd expect to find it. Um, and that's easier to solve. That's exactly what we didn't see in the interactive part as well. It's uh, through the ALU that's. Yeah, yeah. But, but the actor parts are really bad on that because they don't have any carry Yeah, exactly. So if, if you compare it to like Silence or the other devices, you see different speakers. Yeah. I have all of these things actually laying around. We just, if you bear with me. Well, it's quite good the performance you got on the small ones. I, you know, I thought with compressing the pipeline, you might completely destroy your performance, but you haven't. No, that's the thing, right? So, yeah. yeah. But are you still executing one instruction per cycle? Yep. Okay. Yep. No stalling just because it's a single cycle on the other ones. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really impressed by that, actually. You still get roughly the same synthesizable speed, but you're, like, putting everything in one stage. So, I think that's pretty cool. Like, it's, like if you look back here, the logic savings are pretty significant, right? You're saving a lot. Like, what's that as a percent? I don't know. 20, 20, 30%, and you're still getting the same performance. So I reckon five stage pipelines are overrated. <laughs> because. Though that speed might indicate you have something to do with the five stage pipeline that isn't quite sorted yet. Well, I mean, maybe. So, I mean, if we look at this, we go and look at the. Let's go and look at the Pronto Espresso. Pronto. 
and then we go like this, and we go orc soldier SRP. Um, so this is the critical path, right? What? <laughs> bigger, but I can't do smaller. Ah, <laughs> uh, there we go. So if you look here, this is the critical path. So it looks like it, well this is a critical path, right? So it's coming out of the register file and into the ALU. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. So that's, actually it looks like it's a write to an SPR or something. Yeah, yeah, all right, okay, this is not too surprising. It's generating an address, which is then going to the SPR register file, and then I think... Why is that going back to the register result? Uh, probably going through to the uh, debug register access uh, SPRs. Maybe. Since you have SPR access to the ordinary register file there, usually only used by hardware debugger, but... Uh, so you could probably say that's a um, false path. I'd have to check that. But have, have you implemented that? that uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 you, you can read out. Yeah, okay. Debug <coughs> unit. <coughs> it's not a useful path unless you have fast contexts, in which case it is necessary. Yeah, I agree. What? Why, why, why are you... What are you going to use it for? Well, no, I think maybe the... It makes sense if you have multiple register files, because you can peek into the other ones. But yeah, but without the it, current executing it. instruction should not be... shouldn't be doing that. That no, The no, result do, out of the ALU... You might have... You, you might oh, have you might have a, yeah, 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 SPR yeah. address that you're generating. Sorry, you're right. But, but do you really need that function? Is it used anyway? I don't think it is currently. Uh, this is all doing this in one cycle though. Oh no, 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 but if you're doing a move from SPR, that'll store the pipeline. Move from SPR isn't a single cycle in these, uh -huh. in these CPUs. So maybe this is a false path. <laughs> anyway, but um, I think all the paths are roughly that one. Yeah, ALU, some SPR, yeah, SPR address. So, but if you look down at the cappuccino, yeah, on Spartan 6. Let's see if it's the same. I don't think it's the same. I think it's like through the ALU. Maybe it is the same. Oh, you should probably fix that then. So, oh no, no, this is into the cache. Uh, through the ALU and then, yeah, into the cache. Doing some way lookup. Anyway. See, I can understand that. I couldn't understand one if it, in the R1200, I reckon. <laughs> if I saw it. Um, so anyway, that's what we have at the moment. And it's not as fast, and it's not as quick. And in the execution tests I ran, it's not even as efficient at executing. But again, I only ran these yesterday in a bit of a hurry. I didn't check everything. So the number of cycles for the R1200 to do 100 cycles of dry stone in simulation was like 117,000 versus 143,000 for the cappuccino. So that's like 20% slower, I think, something like that. You're getting a lot of stalls on your two-stage pipeline there, aren't you? Yes, the, the fetch. Like, like it's, no, 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 no. it's a... It's There's a, no like, cache. Sorry? No cache on those. Oh, right, so the cappuccino was run with cache? Yes. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. okay. Oh, I was run with cache, so it was a cappuccino, I think. I've got to check that, actually. It would be good to turn the cache off and just check that you aren't stalling the whole time on your... Yeah, yeah. I, but, so I think the problem with the espressos is they don't have cache. And the reason why the delay slot... So you would have thought the delay slot stuff should be better, right? Or the delay slot free implementations would be better because... I don't know, I mean... Have you told the compiler about it? Yeah, yeah. Compiler knows. Compiler is optimising for... And it knows about the different pipeline. Well, the M no delay thing will yeah. make sure that, well, it will just, you know, optimise for no delay slot. Yeah, okay, but, I mean, GCC has a full model of the pipeline and its scheduler. If, you, if it's trying to schedule for a five-stage pipeline and it's got a two-stage pipeline, you're going to get in a mess. Oh, but yeah. it'll still work, but you'll, but you'll get deeply suboptimal code. Good point. 
didn't know that. <laughs> I know a man who knows how to do Problem is, I did this in my spare time, so I'm not paying for it. For a two stage pipeline model. But anyway, no, the problem I think with the Pronto model versus the Espresso model is that uh, the fetch logic is I basically just hacked it until it didn't have a delay slot. I haven't actually optimized it to. For instance, in the fetch stage, if it's got a relative branch, you can figure out exactly, as soon as it sees that instruction, what it should fetch next, and it should go away and do it. Instead of waiting for it to finish executing in the next stage and then tell it where to go. So you could, that's why I think the non-delay slot stuff is a lot better, because you can do things like that. Your fetch stage can be smarter, and the whole thing can be quicker based on or due to that. So anyway, the OS 100 still seems smaller, but I don't know. I haven't really looked into it. Um, and performance in that little test wasn't as good, but I think the fetch stage, well, it had didn't have cache, and I think the fetch stage is um, optimized. However, Stefan has uh, data to the contrary, I think, proving that the R1200 is slower in core marks or something. You, you somehow got it. Yeah, somehow got it running, or the mr one kx cappuccino running better. So that's the end of my bit. Oh, I just want to say, yeah, there's no MMUs. The debug unit isn't fully featured. Um, add with carry, who needs that? And <laughs> there's no internal specification document. So you know stuff explaining how the bus interfaces work. Um, yeah. But what about the interrupt? Do you have that? Yeah, yeah, interrupt, tick timer, no performance counters. Every other bit of arithmetic in ALU is there. The caches in the cappuccino are multi-way. That's pretty good. They're parametrizable, right? Yeah, but yeah. two-way only. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> parametrizable one or two. Yeah, yeah. cool. Um, and what I what I really want to do as well is support. I know I know everyone loves Wishbone, but some companies just don't use it. So, oh, I, I should probably discuss the license quickly as well. But I'll just say, the bus interface. I want it to be very. Uh, modular as well, so I want you to be able to hook it onto anything, that would be good. As well, all the code is licensed with, I'll show you a bit of code. Oh. So, look at the top level, that's the header. So that's this license I put together, the IHDL, which I can probably give I don't know, a little bit more of a talk on later. It's basically the Mozilla public license, but I've changed it, so I've attempted to make it apply to hardware, because I don't think the LGPL is what people think it is. Um, I don't think that it, I don't think the GPLs apply to hardware. The FSF explicitly says it does not apply to hardware. That's if right. Look on the FAQ. Do not use this for hardware. That's right. Yeah. The license itself does. Sorry? The, the license itself does, as far as I recall. It says it's a, soft it's a software license. Yeah, exactly, right? Why did you go down that route then using, rather than using something like the Tapper OA? Because they're the all OA strongly OA. reciprocal. So I, I will disagree with you on this point. I want oh, yeah. companies. Okay, we'll have a fight later. I yeah. want <laughs> ACL companies to use this stuff. I don't want people to go, we're not going to touch because the lawyers don't like the reciprocal nature of this stuff. I mean, it's very hard. I, I was thinking of making it reciprocal and saying, this is the boundary of the core, anything outside of that is, you know, something that is not subject to this license. But I mean, what if your logic infers a multiplier, right, out of Synopsis's <coughs> designware library? Is that thing then subject to that license? I mean, what about all the, the technology library stuff, which all of your code, you know, it, it will encompass that in terms of your boundary? I just think it's too hard to define that license, so I think you should give them a break and make the license not strongly reciprocal, and then you get more people using it. That's my hope anyway. So I took the Mozilla Public License, which is a weak copyleft license, I think, and reworded it for hardware, and put it up on my website, and made a nice little header. So the thing with this, you can take it and uh, change the license to GPL, if you want. There's a thing in the Mozilla Public License which allows you to do that, um, which you can do with this. So you can take all this code and release it on LGPL, GPL if you want. That's why I did this, because um, if people really want to go and do did, that, they can. Did the open source, what, what they call themselves, the, the licensing people, the people who approve all the licenses? Oh, them, yeah. Because um, you discussed yeah. with them, did they accept it? Cause it Bruce Perrins didn't like it, <laughs> but it's because it's not strong copyleft. 
What did John Aikman say about it? Because he's the big open hardware. Guy. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I've asked them. They they still reckon that you can't actually copyright hardware. But I'm not. I don't. Yeah, it's hard. I think this license actually fails as well to do what I want. But the idea is there. The idea is that please just take it. The boundary is the source code. You know. So if you make any modifications to the source code, I want you to release it. That's all. Do a, after that, do with it what you will. Um, anyway, see? Nice Verilog. Oh, parameters. These are all the parameterizable options. Wait for comments? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's <laughs> 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 hey, hey, no, this is no, automatics. Awesome. This is a file just full of automatics. So. No system Verilog. No. Icarus doesn't support it. Okay. All right. Verilator does, but Icarus, Icarus supports a minor subset, I think, of System Verilog. System Verilog would be good for yeah. all of, see all this crap? You can just put it yeah, in like a single, yeah. type def it all the way, yeah. That'd be great. But, now this is an automatics file. I have, I have actual comments in, like, Pronto Espresso. This is the control stage of the Pronto Espresso. See? Where is it? See? Yeah, that's a comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Look, look, comments. There's a big one further down. <laughs> See, look at that. Look at that. Three lines of comment. Two. Two. You didn't get that in the R1200. I'm pretty sure I wrote half an essay somewhere. Anyway. Sometimes so you did, but it generally didn't help you. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so that's that's the core. I think. I don't really have a demo. Uh, I can run a cycle accurate model of it, executing an ECOS test, which is sort of a bit not that exciting. But yeah, here you go. So I've got all these um, ECOS tests. Um, open risk. Oh, ECOS. Oh, get ECOS open risk. The ECOS work, and then like install. Tests, kernel. All right, so there's all these kernel tests, right? Oh, they got dry stone in there. Let's run that. BLT. So this is the, this is ECOS without delay slot, running on a cycle accurate model of the MOL1KX Pronto Espresso pipeline. And you go dash f <coughs> dash lowercase f, please. And then dry stone. I'm not sure if this is going to work. Oh, there you go, look at that. Oh, that'll sit there for a while. 40,000 or 400,000 is a lot. But um, maybe we'd run something else. But I don't know, that, that at least printed that. <laughs> yeah, so it worked. Good point. Exactly. Uh, don't run any of these clock ones, they just take forever. Like, K-thread, what's K-thread? Maybe TM basic. Oops. Mm. TM basic. Okay. Alright, TM basic. Nope, don't know what it's doing. What about K3? K3. Sounds good. Oh, you gotta be like zero or something. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs>